Okay, um, welcome everyone. <clears throat> Um, yeah, so towards biological plausibility, uh, during the presentation, it will become clear why this is the, the title. Um, <clears throat> so from the introduction, uh, uh, you probably picked up some machine learning and statistics there. Uh, that's where I did my PhD in uh, understanding patterns in life sciences data, chemical data. Um, and that is um, different from the linked data, the semantic web presentation that I do right now. In this presentation, I will tell a bit about how I ended up from machine learning in uh, linked open data. Um, so starting with, uh, uh, yeah, basically uh, where this move came from is that the, uh, the complexity of our scientific questions uh, is increasing. And comparing, for example, the kind of questions that were published uh, in this case, uh, 70 years ago, more or less, um, the, 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 the complexity is actually quite, uh, quite different. So uh, this paper from 1948, um, you could publish an well, effectively a machine learning model on something like, uh, what is it, 33 compounds or so, uh, their boiling points and make a regression model out of that. Uh, it's hard to imagine that an, uh, an article like this, a machine learning article with uh, 33 uh, instances, 33 measurements, uh, would give you an, an article at this moment. Um, and... Um, the, the thing here is we know how to do those simple things and uh, they're not innovative, not novel uh, uh, anymore. So we will start looking at more complex things. And obviously uh, the life sciences has plenty of complex, uh, complex questions. And this happens to be one uh, that I looked at uh, about one and a half year ago, just when the, uh, the pandemic uh, kicked in. Uh, what we see here is the biological, or at least some of them, the biological processes behind the infection with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And uh, it's a bit, a bit unreadable, but in the top right, you see the virion uh, uh, with uh, the spike proteins, the membrane protein, and the RNA uh, complex with the nucleosome protein uh, in, the, in the middle somewhere there. Uh, and what then happens when it uh, makes contact to a cell happens after that? Now, the reason for me to start looking into this at the start of the pandemic was to collect all the information that we have about it. Uh, a lot of literature was coming in. We needed an, a place to, to find, to collect the information, to start making sense of what is happening, why this particular virus was different from earlier coronaviruses uh, and where possibly it was the same. Uh, it's the kind of information uh, that you need when you want to study something, uh, something new, a new process. So what I started doing uh, actually at first is, is just, well, effectively making an index, an overview of what is the experimental data. Um, and uh, so things that I started looking at is, okay, well, um, here we have actually uh, uh, the uh, NSP9 uh, dimer uh, at some point that was uh, experimentally observed. This is a uh, crystal structure from the PDB database. And um, so, yeah, we can, we can draw that. We can uh, observe from here that this thing, uh, this protein actually dimerizes. Uh, we don't necessarily uh, immediately know the, uh, the, the, the biological role of that, uh, but in a biological pathway as drawn here in the background, we can do that. So there is this enormous need uh, when studying these uh, complex biological questions uh, to integrate knowledge and experimental data at an, um, an integrated, uh, integrated approach. Um, the reason for this is, is that if you want to start, uh, understand the, uh, uh, the, the patterns that you want to model with the, uh, the AI, with the deep learning or whatever uh, your preferred AI uh, uh, approach is, um, we want to understand not just that pattern, but also the context of it. And for me, this started actually during my PhD, because at some point, well, the machine learning was working pretty well. Uh, it was a bit limited by the amount of data available. Uh, but the other thing was, once you have your model, it predicts something. And you don't, do not want just to understand whether that prediction compared to the model of the, to the, to the pattern that you're modeling makes sense but also the implications of that. And that is something that has intrigued me a, a, a lot after, uh, after my PhD, basically. So if my model predicts something like a log B for a compound, for example, then uh, anything that depends on the log P should also be predicted by that, at least to some extent. So integrating all those, those things, and this slide has a, a number of questions. So 
for the biology. So the infection by SARS-CoV-2 was actually quite close to a main research topic at our department, which is about the nanosafety of nanomaterials, uh, sorry, the, the, the safety, the toxicity of nanomaterials. And these things at some point come into contact with, uh, with cells. And what is, what, what is it that happens after that? Is the material stable? Is the variant stable? How does it enter the cell? How does it, uh, in, in, in the first place, distribute over, uh, uh, over a body? How does it get to the various organs? Does it even get there? Um, do it, does it first contact uh, biomolecules in general as uh, uh, nanomaterials do, they form a protein corona, or as in the SARS-CoV-2, do they target a specific surface uh, protein? And after that, uh, what is happening then? Uh, so in terms of adverse outcome pathways, one of the research lines there, what is the molecular initiating event? What is it, the, the, the first interaction that causes a downstream uh, 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 deterministic flow of key events? So to integrate all this, both experimental data and all this knowledge, we needed an, 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 a sound foundation. And uh, already some 20 years ago, this foundation, this new approach uh, was laid out with, with the semantic web, with uh, semantic web technologies. Uh, so this is the, uh, uh, yeah, the thing that I started using. And the, the nice thing is, of this is uh, the semantic web approach allows you to, uh, to capture data, not always uh, efficiently, uh, but you can easily combine it with other uh, semantic, uh, semantic, more uh, semantic formats that more uh, densely uh, represent data. Uh, but it also uh, can represent uh, ontologies very nicely with the web ontology language, for example. So it's a very simple format. Um, it doesn't require a lot. But it's self-describing, and that makes uh, makes uh, the RDF, the Resource Description Framework, a quite interesting uh, technology. Uh, another extremely important aspect of it is the resource identifiers, uh, which can be uh, uh, resolvable, and that creates a linked data. So we don't just have uh, a, a, an entry in some database. We have a very specific, well-defined way of linking databases. Um, linking databases was possible anyway, but the predominant solution uh, in the life sciences up till then was basically we have one database that links to a lot of things and everything has to go via this one database. We're not entirely away from that and databases like Uniprot and Ensemble, there's still central points in the life sciences to go to. Uh, uh, and from there you go to more specific databases if needed. Uh, but the linked data uh, is more like uh, uh, an, an, a network as we see here. And from any database, you can go to any other database. And there are multiple ways of getting to the same place. And this is something important, I think, for the machine learning. Uh, in machine learning, we're getting from a cause to an effect. But we want to validate that uh, with external data that is um, not even directly related to the problem that we modeled, but related enough that we can uh, try to understand if the new predictions actually make sense in a larger context. Now, um, um, so, so some 10 years ago, um, or a bit more actually, but 10 years ago, the, the article got published. Uh, we started looking at on how can we use the, 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 the semantic web for drug discovery. Uh, and um, uh, somewhere in 2008 or around that time, I joined the healthcare and life sciences uh, community of the World Wide Web Consortium, um, where people were using uh, using these approaches. And I joined there because I was working on a semantic web representation of uh, the Campbell database, the database with binding affinity uh, information, or mostly at least, and, and some other bioactivities. Um, and um, the idea here was uh, also, well, to link that affinity information to, uh, to other databases in this uniform semantic web approach, um, but also that I could uh, more easily get access to data in Campbell uh, related to, uh, to, 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 uh, yeah, to the, uh, the binding inf information itself, so that I could use context of the experiments done uh, in, uh, the, uh, the <clears throat> in the model building, actually. Uh, that's not described in this article, but uh, in a different article. Um, <clears throat> 
that for which I do not have a slide, but in that, that article, we actually uh, used other information uh, um, uh, from, 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 from the Campbell database about the quality of the essays. And uh, well, actually, we did not really expect it, but including the quality of the information actually improved the regression of the binding affinities. Um, of course, we were very happy with that, uh, um, but but that is an is an example of what I think where we need to go uh, by uh, starting integrating other data. Uh, we can actually make all the knowledge, the data, but also all those models uh, interconnected. <laughs> One thing, for example, that uh, that we cannot really do at this moment is ask for all articles that can make some prediction for some molecule. Uh, we have some databases that uh, have QSAR, uh, Q, uh, uh, QSAR models, the QSAR DB, for example, but there actually is not really uh, a, a way to uh, take one uh, simple drug-like compound and make predictions for this compound for all the models ever made uh, and proposed and published in literature. This is a, a level of linking that we cannot even do at this moment. But we're slowly, slowly going into that direction. Um, this is a more recent article, but it's basically proposing the same uh, linked data approach for nanosavity. And what you can see here and what we need for when we want to understand the, uh, the, 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 the savity or the toxicity of nanomaterials is actually integrating of uh, databases from quite different uh, different. Uh, uh, domain uh, background from biology, from uh, uh, ecotoxicology, um, environmental sciences, um, uh, the, you, you, human health care, and, and, and I don't know what. Uh, we also see actually at the top uh, some really chemical things like, uh, like the chemical structures of it or how the nanomaterial is synthesized. All that information from quite different backgrounds all have uh, important aspects that we need when we want to assess the, uh, the safety of nanomaterials. And a uniform approach here is, of course, uh, very important. Um, uh, for, for here, uh, for, for the nano safety, uh, we're, we're, we're starting to work on these nano safety uh, things. The Inanimapa project made a good step forward there, uh, but we're, we're not quite there yet. And the current programs, um, the current projects in the nano safety cluster are not fully up to speed with these technologies yet. And this slide has a couple of, uh, uh, yeah, a couple of the papers, uh, the Campbell one I mentioned uh, earlier, where we use this approach, the semantic web approach, to support our integrative systems biology, the the, the way we uh, we um, try to answer uh, uh, the, yeah, our biological questions. Um, in the top left, so the Campbell database has linked open data that goes back quite a bit already. Uh, the PubChem has an RDF uh, representation of that. Um, we don't see a lot of articles really using that part of PubChem at this moment, uh, but it's picking up. Uh, top right, uh, our biological database, so that pathway, for example, about the uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, early on in the presentation, we have a semantic web rep representation of that. And with that, we can do queries uh, cross-checking this uh, this pathway database with uh, other databases like uh, like Lipid Maps uh, or Campbell or Uniprot, uh, uh, also available in a semantic web representation, along, of course, with all the ontologies that are represented in OWL uh, that we can do and make use of as well. Uh, in the bottom right, uh, this is some newer work. So I mentioned the adverse outcome pathways that describe uh, uh, so how some chemical initially uh, uh, interacts with, uh, uh, with, 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 with cells uh, and causes the, some downstream key events like cytotox uh, uh, sorry, um, oxidative stress, uh, cytotoxicities, and uh, things like genotoxicity. Now, um, getting to the ingredients of, uh, of all this, I already mentioned uh, the resource description framework. If you haven't had a look at that, I strongly recommend to have a look at it. Uh, there is the core resource description framework, but there are a number of technologies uh, built on top of that, like Sparkle, uh, query language like SQL for more for, for more, the more traditional relational databases. Um, 
there is a shex for shape expressions, which is a way to describe uh, the structure of the data. Um, there are various ontology and vocabulary related systems, the web ontology mentioned for, 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 for ontologies, or the more, well, the simple knowledge organization system, which has a more loose um, uh, representation of relation of different concepts. Uh, underneath all this is the concept of a triple. A triple is consists of three parts, uh, and we have two examples here from the nano safety field. Uh, in the top example, we have a data set. So this is a resource. This is a database entry, if you like. Um, and um, uh, that has a, a number of triples. So the first triple there is that the data set is, uh, is a, uh, that the a here indicates it is of some, some type, and the type here being a data set as specified by the vocabulary of interlinked data sets, uh, here represented with the void prefix. Um, the semicolon at the end of that first line indicates that the uh, the subject, the, the, the data set, the ETOX data set here, uh, is repeated on the next line. So the second triple here is ETOX data set, uh, has a title from the Dublin core terminology uh, ontology, and the title given as literal. So uh, in this representation here, a bit compact with the, with the semicolons and, uh, uh, and the use of prefixes, we have a very precise definition of the information that we have about the data set at the top or a nanomaterial at the bottom. And um, uh, uh, so we have two core resources here, ETOX data set and at the bottom NFYS16-M12, uh, which is one particular nanomaterial, um, but all these things, they can link to other uh, other bits of information. So for the second one, for example, it links to and has part, uh, the part being in the, the core of the material there, or uh, uh, on, on the fourth line in the second example, it refers to a bit of information about, uh, about the size. And uh, that linking that these triples provide gives us also the opportunity to link to other databases. So a single database or a, or a whole linked network of databases, it's all exactly the same representation. Now, on the ontology side, uh, we, have, we have the following. And uh, here we have one of the ontologies that we have been working on. Uh, uh, Jenna, the first speaker, actually was heavily involved in, uh, in this in NMAP ontology as well. Um, as well as the, uh, the the chemical information ontology, and these are still ontologies that we use to represent this information, uh, and they provide us with a common language to link information, so that we can understand why two entries are from different databases are uh, are connected, uh, that we can try to understand how we use that information in our machine learning, uh, all those kind of things. So one of the things here uh, is that. Um, we can query information from databases, and if we have size information about a nanomaterial, for example, uh, but there's different kinds of size information, the ontology will actually tell us what the kinds of uh, sizes are, and uh, from the ontology, we can understand how we compare those sizes. Uh, not always, of course, but uh, but sometimes sometimes it's uh, it's the diameter of a material, and sometimes it's the longest length of a material, the longest dimension. Now, um, to get all that information together, there is the Sparkle query language. And here's an example from the, the Wikipalkways database, our uh, database of biological uh, processes. And uh, what we see here actually is a, a query that starts with information from, uh, uh, from Wikipalkways. Uh, we see the same triple-like structure here, uh, but also with the select, distinct, where, and sorts, uh, and the union uh, on the fourth line. Uh, we see, see the aspects that you might recognize from uh, from SQL as well. Um, more water. Mm. I'm sorry, a dry throat. Um, <clears throat> um, and uh, so, so we're getting information here from the uh, from the Wiki Pathways ontology on the line 11. We see some filtering, so restricting the information is the same on line 13 again. But on line 14, something interesting happens. 
So here we're defining a service, a different Sparkland point, so a different database, a Nextprot in this case. So we're getting part, part of the information from Wikidata, but using this linked data network, we're actually in this query, not just asking this database, but also a database somewhere else in this linked data, uh, linked data network. <laughs> Uh, this database, uh, Nextprot. Um, I'm actually not entirely sure, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that uh, this server is actually being hosted in Geneva, as, uh, whereas the Wikipathways one is run by us in Maastricht. Um, the nice thing about linked data and, and, and Sparkle and everything, all these things are open technologies, uh, so you can easily combine them and extend them. And this snorkel interface, uh, snorkel in, uh, graphical interface uh, actually is an integration of that. And you might also see that the Sparkle queries is actually just a set of files in a GitHub repository. Um, so we can actually e very easily uh, point to a different GitHub repository with uh, with Sparkle queries, as long as that Sparkle queries are uh, using the same patterns as used by Wiki Pathways, the same ontologies, uh, the same shapes, uh, uh, then those other queries also automatically work. Uh, I, I do like to stress when it comes to fair data, uh, RDF uh, is just one representation and it doesn't mean that something like a spreadsheet uh, uh, is not uh, not semantic. And in fact, actually, uh, if you carefully craft spreadsheets, they can be pretty fair and integration of uh, RDF into a spreadsheet or a spreadsheet into RDF is uh, quite feasible then. Uh, at the same time, um, on the previous slide, we saw this Sparkle query, but once you have a set of uh, Sparkle queries of interest, you can actually wrap them in other APIs. So we saw the Snorkel web interface, which is, which is more human oriented. We can also translate the Sparkle queries into a REST API. Uh, uh, and um, I'm not going to uh, explain REST APIs here, but there are different uh, ways where you make a very specific call, but all the details of the Sparkle are hidden and you just give some input variables, uh, like what is the pathway you want the information on, and then you get all your data about, the, about that pathway. So, um, <clears throat> As an example of how we're using these, these linked data approaches, uh, I have this question from the nano safety field and it originates from, uh, from the NNMA pro uh, project. And the question basically is, and this is a very relevant question, the question comes up every day still. So um, which metalox sites show some form of genotoxicity? <coughs> And the uh, redundant white space here is uh, is deliberately because we can start filling it in. If we want to use semantic web approaches, we need to understand the semantics. So the first thing that we need to do is uh, map the, the terms, uh, the metal oxides and the genotoxicity here to ontology terms. Uh, and in this case, a metal oxide in the nanoparticle ontology is entry 1541. And the genotoxicity is available in the bioassay ontology as, uh, as entry uh, 2167. So this, this, this first thing, we have the ontology annotation and um, the translation of a human readable label, label to an ontology term is sometimes a bit tricky. Uh, uh, so we, we, we take that as a starting point here. So you, you can actually look up these, uh, these, these things in, uh, in the ontology and the NPO uh, 1541 is actually highlighted here. And the same thing we can do for the uh, bioassay ontology. Um, we might want to compare with the ontology to see if the place in the hierarchy is completely what we would expect, uh, 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 so that, non that we're pretty sure that the na metal oxide nanoparticle that we wanted to ask about is in fact indeed what that uh, ontology term uh, provides, but that's what we have the web ontology language for. So with that information and some knowledge about the shapes, uh, and that is where, for example, shape expression comes in as, an, as a documentation of those shapes. Uh, if we have those things, <clears throat> we can uh, translate our uh, uh, human readable question into a Sparkle query. And highlighted here are uh, the, the ontology terms that we started uh, with and uh, the substance resource, substance res, uh, the question mark in front there uh, indicates this is the, uh, uh, the, the bit of information that we're interested in uh, and basically the output of the query. Uh, so 
uh, starting with this information, we can uh, can uh, do this. Now, this query is quite complex, and we see at the top there this union uh, and sorts. What is happening there is that um, this genotoxicity assay, actually, we saw that on the previous slide here, has an, uh, a subclass, a DNA damage assay. It's just one here, uh, but if you consider, for example, a membrane potential assay, there are multiples underneath. If you look on the left side for metal oxide, there are even more classes underneath. So this 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 classification in uh, in the ontology, as we also saw in the in the first uh, first presentation, uh, this is information that is very valuable. When we only have to ask for metal oxides, and then the semantic web can figure out uh, what all the specific metal oxides are aggregated on uh, all that information, and we get a result table here back here. We did not have to ask for which titanium oxide nanoparticles cause uh, a genotoxicity uh, and a DNA intel experiment here, actually, because the ontology combined with the uh, 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 with the data itself provided us uh, uh, with all uh, all the information uh, the query answering system, the Sparkle endpoint, needed to uh, to give these results. Um, <clears throat> Now, um, yeah, no particular reason so for, for this slide really, but just, just an indication of the link between these nanomaterials and these molecular initiating events. Uh, we started an, a, a, a machine making machine readable a number of those biological processes. And for this, uh, we set up the nanomaterials.wikipartbase.org portal about, uh, about the processes of, uh, of these nanomaterials. And by using this, we uh, because Wikipathways is available as Semantic Web, we start building up this large knowledge bases where we can link all sorts of things. Um, another use case of uh, the Semantic uh, Wikipathways is uh, when we have that that same snorkel interface here uh, here uh, that we saw earlier, uh, we can make a federated query with uh, with other databases. So I showed the the, uh, the federated query with Nextprot, but the same thing we can do federated query with uh, uh, with uh, with with the Campbell RDF. Uh, this is not the exact representation. Uh, sorry, the the exact implementation that we used on the right side here, but the uh, the effect is the same. Uh, so in the middle, in gray and blue, uh, we have proteins and diseases. And uh, uh, that is information resulting from uh, from an analysis uh, of wiki pathways. And we can complement that with information about the drugs. Uh, so basically, uh, this is a, a kind of uh, drug repurposing uh, a study. So if you have some disease uh, and you know which proteins are in there from a biological process database, you can go off to something like Campbell, uh, Campbell and find uh, 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 related information there. These use cases are still pretty uh, pretty simple, and this is uh, sorry. This is mostly because um, we do not have enough resources uh, available as uh, in the semantic web format. So this is this is our main f uh, uh, main focus right now. Um, I reckon that one percent of our scientific uh, uh, knowledge at this moment is captured in a machine readable way. Maybe it's even even less. Um, but we have a number of projects to to increase this. So so one approach is to make large databases available as RDF, as we saw earlier with Campbell, with uh, PubChem, uh, or large ontologies, uh, application or specific uh, specific uh, ontologies like uh, like like Cabby. Um, and and these things just keep growing and. Um, yeah, the title of the slide is linked open data. The open here is actually quite quite essential because the nice thing about open is it typically does not go away uh, or does not go away as easily. It doesn't die when a startup company dies, for example. It can still die. We also still see that. Um, <clears throat> but uh, it's much easier for open data for someone else to pick that up. Actually, just like with the Campbell RDF right now, because the uh, RDF at uh, the European Bioinformatics Institute at this moment, they it doesn't get the same attention as it did, uh, did before. But because it's all, uh, uh, all open, we just set up a Campbell RDF uh, uh, endpoint at Maastricht again, uh, which was just a matter of, uh, well, actually, uh, Amar did that in three hours' time from uh, from from the idea to the having the Spark endpoints running, um, and um, but there is also this 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 long tail of data. This is where Wikidata and Scolia comes in. Uh, Wikidata is a machine readable way uh, database mirror project of uh, Wikipedia, uh, supporting Wikipedia. In fact, 
where um, a lot of data is getting end, uh, added, but it's also being uh, a central resource linking out to other databases, but not repeating that data so much. It does that sometimes, but also linking out, but in a semantic way with a smart sparkle endpoint. So we're allowing federated queries with other, uh, other databases. So we can federate wiki pathways with wiki data, which we can do, for example, uh, uh, to get smiles representations of the metabolites in wiki pathways. We don't have to put the, uh, the, uh, the smiles uh, of those metabolites in wiki pathways itself. Uh, we have identifiers already there uh, to, and, and therefore mappings to wiki data. And the rest of the information comes from wiki data. We don't have to put PDB, uh, 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 crystal structure identifiers, in, in, in uh, wiki pathways. We can use the linked open data network to get that information. And the same way, we have a lot of other databases. And these two papers uh, explain the ideas of, of, uh, of wiki data for, uh, uh, for, 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 uh, yeah, for research. Um, and on the right side, that is, that is Colia. As Colia is, an, is a graphical interface to show this information and more information about getting information about life sciences, can making all those connections, then these two papers are a good uh, starting point for reading. Uh, the left side is uh, really a longer, longer term project uh, from Andrew Seuss uh, team and Andra Wagmeister, a uh, former colleague of mine in Maastricht. Uh, they bootstrapped this and I contributed there from a small molecule perspective. Uh, but Wikidata as a knowledge graph for the life sciences. And this knowledge graph is growing very fast. This is just a group that collaborated on this bit, but uh, there is a large community of people using, uh, of life scientists using Wikidata. Uh, and on the right side, that paper explains how we use shape expressions to, to do the quality control of all this data integration and highlighting inconsistencies between databases. Not every inconsistency between databases is an error. Uh, sometimes it has a different thing, a different, uh, different reason, uh, like different types of things the database tries to achieve. Um, another example of the RDF plus uh, Sparkle is this, uh, this, this book where we're back to, uh, to SARS-CoV-2 that we started this presentation with. Uh, and here uh, I have a book written in Markdown with interactive, uh, interactive data uh, directly pulled from Wikidata. Um, and because this book is basically a long set of small bits of text and Sparkle queries, I can update this book uh, every day. And I typically at this moment do that every other day. Um, uh, but uh, as soon as new information comes in in Wikidata, again, there is a large, uh, large group of people uh, looking into a lot of details of SARS-CoV-2 uh, in Wikidata, uh, uh, then this, uh, if these updates automatically get entered into this book. Um, a last example is uh, also around, uh, well, natural products that came up in the previous talk as well. Uh, uh, so um, uh, a, a, a group of uh, natural product uh, researchers uh, started the Lotus Initiative, and all this data actually is managed uh, through Wikidata. And uh, in the top right, you see the DOI of the preprint, and uh, you see a screenshot here of, uh, of, of how Wikidata here for or nano product, uh, nano product uh, research is used to, uh, to, to, to make data more interoperable and with that more linked. So summarizing, so for the biological plausibility, are we there yet? Uh, no, as, as I said, uh, we still only have a very small percentage of all the experimental evidence, data, all the knowledge at this moment captured in a machine readable way. This is why we still make uh, 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 machine models that take one input and, and, and predict one output. The models are getting a bit more complex, but they're still pretty much one relation at a time. Uh, this, is, this is the next step in, 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 in all, uh, all this. Um, another comment that I, that I made uh, this morning actually is that uh, what we see here, the, 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 uh, the biological plausibility so what is underlying the, the, the biological explanation of what is happening of all those complex processes, that's very complex. But at the same time, uh, we can actually start modeling this complexity, complexity by this enormously fast growing uh, 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 open data uh, that we have available. And it looks like that uh, our computing power is more or less uh, keeping in sync with, uh, with this uh, new knowledge, uh, knowledge coming in. 
So we're not there yet, uh, but there is a lot of really interesting things going to happen in the next uh, next couple of years. And uh, some some things that we see with deep learning now are really taking advantage of all the linked, uh, links between uh, knowledge bases uh, and uh, doing really uh, interesting stuff. Um, so that is basically this uh, this this data. Um, uh, the more data we need, to, we make available as as fair, as interoperable, and reusable, and under an open license, so that people actually can also not just theoretically use it, but also practically use it. The more complex uh, the models are that we can start modeling. But we have a lot a lot to go. So so acknowledgement. Uh, I've collaborated with a lot of people in the past. Uh, this is where uh, where they uh, they work or worked. Uh, uh, so a lot of lot of collaborations actually. Um, um, and uh, I'll end with this slide. This is actually an, uh, 60 70 percent of all the call authors. And in highlight, uh, in, in in bold are the people uh, in in our group at this moment that uh, that we uh, that that. We work, sorry, that work together on using these semantic web technologies to answer integrative systems biology questions. Uh, but you will see a lot of other names uh, uh, showing up, uh, and some here in the audience. Uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, for your attention, and I welcome a lot of questions. <laughs>